happy to be here, although not so happy to be at the last panel of the day. That's always a deadly panel. Um, plus, or in fact, a lot of my points have been sort of said by others, so you can snooze through the parts that are kind of repetitive because unfortunately or fortunately, um, some of it will be. Um, so I'm here, obviously, to talk about um, democratic responsiveness and linkage in the U.S. and Europe, and it'll actually take off on um, some of the comments I already made. Like I said, I think some of the points have been made by um, other panelists. So as a political scientist, one thing I sort of thought I would start off with is by noting that there's been a lot of talk about democratic decline in the news. Um, in fact, if we look deeper into the data, the amount of democratic decline that's gone on in the world is not historically unprecedented after waves of democracy. The really unusual thing, in fact, is the decline in democratic rankings on countries or in countries that had, we had thought of as kind of stable liberal democracies, that is to say, the United States and Europe. So this is really the puzzle, right? What's been going on in countries that we thought, you know, had liberal democracy that was working well? Um, so here's just some kind of graphs that, I mean, probably, again, familiar to all of you, the share of votes going to parties that are kind of anti-establishment. Generally, these are kind of populist parties. Um, and in Europe, um, despite some of the um, unease with conflating these two parts of the political spectrum that we heard earlier in the day, this has actually been happening on both the right and the left. That is to say, extremist parties, radical parties, parties at the end of the political spectrum, I would not characterize them necessarily as anti-democratic, but they are often anti-liberal, and I would consider to be populist. This has actually been growing, again, in Europe on both sides. We've seen vote shares for both of these types of parties um, increasing over the past couple of decades. Now, in the political science literature, right, but not obviously within the literature that most of you guys um, actually work in, the, the sort of explanations for this phenomenon, right, the support for, again, I'm going to use the term populist, parties has generally fallen into this kind of explanation, right, a focus on what you might think of as root causes or grievances, right? So the first and the one that we heard some discussion of this morning was economic, right? We know this argument. The you know people who support populist parties are you know sort of the losers of globalization. They're at-risk workers. They're low-educated folks. They're white-collar workers, blue-collar workers. Places um, where um, you know they live in areas where there's been declining social mobility and opportunity. Yada yada yada. We know this argument. We heard a version of it this morning. Um, then another argument, we also heard a version of this morning, of the so social and cultural arguments, right? That people who vote for populist parties are people who feel their identities are threatened. Um, this is a sort of nativist backlash against immigrants and refugees in Europe, in the U.S., immigrants and mobilized minority groups. Um, these are people who kind of feel that their status in society, again, is kind of, you know, the white majority, is threatened, again, by these... Um, different trends, and so, you know, here's the sauce of populism, right? Populism kind of appeals to people who feel that their status or their identity group is being threatened. The third explanation, which I hadn't thought to include, actually, because it's usually considered ancillary rather than a primary explanation, is the one, actually, most of you guys have focused on, which is changes in the media landscape as kind of, if not causing populism, as the term I think Silvio used this morning, as having an elective affinity with it. So I posit that as kind of a third major explanation. Obviously, all of these things have something to them. So I'm not here to tell you that they're wrong. I'm here to focus on another aspect of um, another causal factor in the analysis of the growing dissatisfaction with democracy and the rise of populism, which is <coughs> problems with democratic institutions. That is to say, the supply side of the equation, as we sometimes refer to it in political science, that basically a main cause for rising dissatisfaction with democracy and therefore willingness to, to vote for populist parties is that democratic institutions have really declined over the last decades. They have become less responsive. They have become less democratic. When we think about things in this way, right, again, to use a sort of phrase or a, a, an expression that we heard also early in the day, populism becomes a consequence of democratic dysfunction, right? It's not, it's a consequence. We should see it on the sort of other side of the causal chain, right? So the real problem is democratic dysfunction. Um, Well-functioning democracies are ones where institutions 
channel and respond to the demands of the people. That's inherent, in fact, in most of the definitions we have in democracy. Um, other important things to note, populist parties, or populist voters, rather, are precisely those who always say in um, surveys on either side of the Atlantic that they are the most distrustful of government, they are the most dissatisfied with democracy, and what they want, right, and this is why I have a little bit of a problem with some of the arguments that Lance made at lunch, what they really want, they claim, is more democracy, not less. They are not anti-democratic. They may be anti-liberal, but they are not anti-democratic. In fact, again, their complaints are often that democracy is not responsive. It is, in short, not democratic, right? So you can see some charts. These are not my own. I don't have the capacity to do that. Sorry for lack of fancy graphics. These are just Pew surveys, right? And one indication of this is another sort of finding, consistent finding over and over again is populist voters are always extremely favorable towards direct democracy. They love things like referenda. Why? Because it gives them a sense of efficacy. I vote, and there's the outcome. They don't feel like they're getting that from um, democratic institutions. They feel like democracy is no longer democratic. They have no voice in the system. Now, there's lots of manifestations of this. I'm going to zip through them because I don't have a lot of time and because other people are going to talk about it. So. One is political parties. I mentioned that before. Um, one of my panelists, my co-panelist, Julian Zari, has written a lot about this. Declining political parties, the strength of political parties at the same time as you've had um, rising partisanship. Lots of work in the American political science about documenting this and why it's happened. Theda Scotchpole and her colleagues at Harvard about how increasingly funding, for instance, goes on outside of parties rather than through them. The hollowing out of parties and this is just, again, the European part of it. You can see how party membership in Europe has just really dropped dramatically over the past year. So really, a change in parties, which, again, are supposed to be the linkage between voters and governments, right? They're just not the beasts that they were during an earlier era. Um, also, super important, particularly, I think, in the European context, the decline in particular of the center left. Probably even those of you who are not Europeanists know that social democratic, socialist, labor parties eviscerated in almost all European countries. Why is this particularly important? Because historically, these are the parties that were supposed to represent the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the people who felt like they were being left behind. And they don't do that anymore. These are not parties that stand for those people, right? They have lost that ability to take those people and push them through democratic institutions and processes towards, again, policy making, political outcomes, yada, yada, yada. And so this has left, again, historically, the disadvantaged, the disenfranchised, the disaffected without champions, leaving them, of course, open to vote for populist parties. Parties. The second thing unrepresentative politicians and elites. This is a book that came out a little while ago. It focuses on several European countries, but the numbers are reflective of wider trends, right? Over the course of the last decades, the people who are supposedly representing voters, right, the heads of parties, politicians, have become increasingly socioeconomically, educationally, very distinct from many of the groups they purportedly represent. So again, the center left is the best example of this, but it's true across the board. It's true in rural areas, for instance, in many parts of Europe, probably in the United States as well. People would come up through the ranks of parties or unions or other kinds of things. They would have some connection with their local communities or things that they shared with voters. It's no longer the case. Politicians and elites now much more, again, socioeconomically um, wealthier, very highly educated, so they're much more distinct from voters than they would have been, let's say, during the initial post-war years, again, particularly in Europe, um, which is the area I know best. Um, okay, so declining responsiveness of political institutions, parties, elites, um, governments, right? Again, one could give talks, write many books on this, but again, the sense not incorrect on the parts of voters, that governments are simply not giving them the policies that they demand or that they favor, right? For all kinds of reasons. <coughs> Globalization has taken power out of the hands of national governments. It's been handed over to technocrats and bureaucrats. This is particularly resonant in Europe, right, where the argument is often made that much policymaking has been taken out of the hands, again, of national 
democratically elected governments and hand it over to a bureaucratic, technocratic EU. That is, of course, correct, right? It ha that has, in fact, happened, right? Whether that's good or bad, you can debate, but that is exactly what has happened. And those people are at best only indirectly controlled um, by democracy. Um, in the United States, a lot of people have argued that the fact that we have run such high deficits, right, and we've therefore, governments therefore have less room for maneuver. They can institute fewer new policies, right? Their maneuverability has really declined over the course of the post-war period. Lobbying, the role of money, this is particularly important in the United States, but of course it's also important in Europe as well. The sense that who gets their policies enacted? Who gets to buy politicians? Who gets to run for office? People with money or access to money? And again, in the United States, probably the most important, again, mentioned before, is um, the idea that growing inequality has really skewed policymaking outcomes. Lots of research by people like, again, mentioned before, Larry Bartels, Martin Gillins, his, co the co his colleague Ben Page, really showing that, again, policymaking outcomes or arguing that policymaking outcomes don't reflect the wishes of the people in any sense of the word, right? But in fact, really are most responsive to the demands of the wealthy. Um, okay, I'll skip past this, right? And again, also important is that economic inequality linked not only to policymaking outcomes, again, less responsiveness by democratic institutions, but economic inequality also linked to participation rates. This is true in Europe and the United States both in traditional types of participation. We talk in the US about voting, but in fact, it's even more true of other kinds of participation. If you look at the relationship between um, economic inequality, educational inequality, and forms of participation other than voting, um, do I write my congressperson? Do I participate in campaigns? Do I get involved in um, political and civil society organizations? All have an inverse correlation with um, economic, uh, with, um, income, wealth, and education status. This is also true, apparently, according to Pew and others, with online activity as well. So this is problematic for democracy inequality more generally. Pip is not here, but um, again, in the United States, also her electoral integrity project has found that elections in the United States just among the worst in the Western world, right? So again, it's not so much that Trump is correct. He's not, right? There's not millions of voters out there voting who are not supposed to, but all of these kinds of features of our electoral process really very poor in comparison to um, other countries. I am really running out of time. Okay, so um, again, populist voters, these are the ones most distrustful, most dissatisfied with democracy, right? And so the problem is that they have a point, right? Politicians, parties, political institutions, governments have in fact grown less responsive over time and particularly less responsive to them. So again, I can't play my videos, but I would love to. Um, video from Donald Trump, video from Marine Le Pen, their promises or their appeals, I am your voice, right? Yeah, because the people that they appeal to really have not had a voice, right? They are not incorrect in their perceptions of how democracy has responded to them. Now, I think they're incorrect in turning to these folks to give them the voice, but their ability to claim this is in fact based in fact. It's not fake news. These people have not had a voice because democratic institutions, again, really have declined in responsiveness over the past decades in some pretty profound ways. Um, and I'm over, so I'm going to stop. Thank you very much. Um, are you, are you